Hello and welcome to another episode of Coffee and Conversation by Now That's Good Coffee. And today I have an amazing thing in store. I cannot believe that I was a part of this. So last night I was in an interview um, on Conversations with Jenna Lynn, hosted by Jenna Lynn Gleave. And guess what? So we were talking about aliens, UFOs, you know, you know how it goes. Okay, but guess who was the featured guest? Guess who it was? None other than the senior astronomer of the SETI Institute. Can you believe that? What an honour it was and what a nice man he is. So I'm going to play this interview, but I want you to stay tuned because it's, it's wonderful. But at the end, I'm going to give my final thoughts on the interview, some extra thoughts that I want to add. Okay, so enjoy it, and I'll see you after. Do you believe in aliens? Have you ever seen one? Do you know someone who's seen one? What do you, how do you feel about aliens? Today, I am so fortunate to share Dr. Seth Sostak with you. He is a senior astronomer an Institute Fellow at the SETI Institute located in California, USA. Also today on the show, I have Jamie Small, who is an alien enthusiast. And I am so happy to bring the two of them together for you. Gentlemen, welcome to Conversations with Jenny Lynn. <music> Thank you very much, Jenny Lynn. Thank you. Jamie, I decided it would be a good idea to ask Seth if he would be willing to do a show with you as a part of it because of your views about aliens. So why don't we start by having you tell Seth, you know, your views on this subject and why you're so passionate about it. Certainly, well, thank you for asking. Okay, I'd love to. Okay, so, um, I have never uh, seen an alien, nor a UFO, unfortunately. It would be lovely to, but not that I know of. Um, so the passion derives from um, simple like mathematical logic, which I'm sure you'll comment on, Seth, because this is your field. But I think um, really what resonated with me is when I heard about the, you know, the Drake equation from Frank Drake, you know, which is obviously coming up with the formula of the likelihood, the probability of life beyond planet Earth. And um, no doubt you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but this calculation was to calculate the probability of intelligent life, not bacterial life. And the final outcome of the whole, you know, it's a long story, but it was calculated about 10,000 advanced civilizations just within the Milky Way alone, which I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that most modern day scientists think that he was off and that he dramatically underestimated that because, you know, we have like obviously, you know, potentially a lot more. And I think in modern times, um, scientists have, um, you know, discovered what they call the Kepler planets, you know, Earth-like planets in the Goldilocks zone that can possibly harbor life. And, you know, as the years pass by, we're coming across more and more of these. Um, so, you know, it seems as though there, there's quite a lot of planetary systems with a planet that is, is a good candidate, but that's only life as we know it. Um, you know, we, we're, we're basing this, and so is the Frank, uh, the, the, the Drake equation based on, um, you know, what we require um, to be healthy and to thrive and to survive. You know, so we're not even considering any other type of life form that perhaps has different requirements. So I think to me it's so logical. Now also um, uh, there's the you know the ancient um, uh, ancient religions, ancient stories, ancient writings that allude to aliens. Uh, there's the uh, anomaly in the evolutionary process of man. There's that sort of uh, what many call like the missing link. 
which creationists would attribute to like God having intervened and you know created humankind. But you could also say that this anomaly of sudden a sudden evolutionary leap was maybe alien intervention. I happen to go along with that theory as a possibility. So to me, there's just so much, but there's also so much eyewitness testimony. There's um, uh, radar and satellite um, evidence of, um, extra, you know, not, sorry, not extraterrestrial. <laughs> uh, Donna jumped the gun here, but we're talking about like UFOs. And, and I am aware of the fact that a UFO does not necessarily mean extraterrestrial. UFO is a UFO, it's unidentified. It could be a number of possibilities. Mm -hmm. However, like the process of elimination, and one thing I wanted to ask you about today, Seth, and no doubt we'll get to it at some point, is this recent news, the Pentagon disclosure to Congress where you know there's been a lot of activity with the Navy out at sea, and there's all these like UFOs, they call them UAPs, don't they? Because UFO has like, you know, people are embarrassed of that word, so they sort of call them, you know, UAPs. And um, you know, they've got like crazy maneuverability, um, no visible propulsion, they're doing crazy things. And you know, it could be foreign adversary, they're saying it could be a foreign adversary, they're not ruling out extraterrestrials, which I think is a really big statement from the government to actually say we don't rule it out. They don't believe it. They're saying we, we're not saying it's extraterrestrial, but we don't rule it out. I think that's a big leap for the government. They've never actually said that before. I was quite pleased with that result. So, you know, like for me personally, as I sit and I observe these things and I watch the news, I'm thinking, well, okay, you know, process of elimination, this advanced technology is pretty advanced. It's not up for debate because like they know, because, you know, we got, um, trained observers, you know, documenting these sightings. We've got it collaborated with radar and satellite. You know, it's not a question like, are these things in the sky? Yes, they're in the sky. Like we know that. So the question only remains is what are they and who controls them? And so considering how advanced they are, we can't prove it, but it would, wouldn't be so far-fetched to believe that maybe they're extraterrestrial. And what do we do? We're UFOs, we're aliens, we send craft to other planet, well, to, to Mars, you know, I mean, you know, and the moon, you know, when we do that, like, we're UFOs, why is it so far-fetched to believe that others are likewise sending probes or drones or whatever they're sending to our planet? So it's not so unbelievable to me. It's, it's very, I, I, if I had to put some money on it, I would put my money on that they exist. I suppose the question is, is have they visited Earth? Um, I think it's a good possibility, but obviously like we don't have cast iron proof of that. So that's where I'm at with, um, you know, aliens and UFOs and whatnot. So if that answers the question, hope it wasn't too long winded. Well, uh, what's your re response? Well, Je <laughs> well, Jenny Lynn, I think Jamie's not gonna be happy with my answer. Okay, but, please, please go ahead. <laughs> well, there, there was there were many, many things in that, uh, Jamie. I mean, we could talk about the Drake equation. Uh, yeah. I don't think anybody says that Frank Drake is wrong because mm -hmm. nobody knows whether he's right or wrong. And he himself, sure. I mean, his office is just down the, the hall here, uh, although he doesn't come in very much anymore. But uh, I've asked him many times, where did he, many times, you know, your estimate for the number of societies in the Milky Way galaxy that might be broadcasting radio signals, for example, that are going through our bodies as we sit here, you know, he says, yeah, well, maybe 10,000. But when I press him, when anybody presses him, Frank, where did you get that number? He'll say, well, you know, I, I, it just occurred to me driving in uh, from Santa Cruz yesterday. I mean, it's, it's nothing more than that. It's just his order of magnitude estimate. Uh, Carl Sagan thought there might be millions. There are plenty of people who write me emails who say it's probably only one. We're the smartest things in the galaxy, if not the universe, which is yeah. a nice thought and probably <laughs> caused by the fact that, that for the first 10 years of your life, your parents were probably telling you something very similar, but it's probably not mm -hmm. true. Now, let me not the, the, go any farther on the question of you know, Drake's equation. That's a different subject, but the one I can tell that you're a little more interested in is, you know, are we being visited? Now, mm -hmm. here in the States, I don't know what the situation is in Ireland, but in the States, one third of the population thinks that we are being visited and that the government is covering it up. 
Okay, mm -hmm. one third. So that's 100 million people on this continent and not counting Canada, Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean or any other such a wonderful place. It's a very, very common belief, uh, which of course, organizations like the History Channel and so forth like to take advantage of because they know the public's interested. There's no good evidence to, you, you will be hard pressed to find any scientists who believe that actually, essentially none. And, and the reason is the evidence is so poor. I mean, it's also difficult, right? Yeah, we can get to Mars, you know, Elon Musk can send a rocket to Mars. He hadn't done it yet, but he could send a rocket to Mars that would get there in six or seven months. But if you want to go to the nearest other star at that speed, it would take 75,000 years. And that's really a long time to sit in the middle seat eating, you know, uh, peanuts off your lap, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not easy. That's not easy. It isn't to say it's impossible. It doesn't violate physics, but it's not easy. As far as the evidence for this, there are 10,000 witness reports every year in the US, 10,000, that's a lot, large number. A lot of them are people whom you would normally trust in a business transaction. Many of them are pilots and so forth. Navy pilots in particular are really good at looking for other aircraft. They're not so good at looking for alien spacecraft, but anyhow, they're, they're perfectly good explanations for those three Navy videos, by the way, that don't involve aliens. And the report that the, uh, uh, the military intelligence, well, let's just say the Pentagon for shorthand, that uh, the Pentagon released about a month and a half ago, eight pages. It didn't even mention extraterrestrials or aliens. It didn't. And that's because they don't consider it a very serious, uh, th that's my take on it. They didn't take it, consider it a very serious hypothesis. Mm -hmm. But so uh, we'll have to agree to disagree. I don't think there's any good evidence that they're here. Well, no. Um, yeah, well, thank you for that. And um, yeah, I agree that there is no cast iron evidence. Um, I, I, would, I, I just believe that it's a possibility. Do you, do you believe it's a possibility or do you rule it out completely? Well, uh, I, I, I'm certainly not convinced, but it's, as I say, it doesn't violate physics. So it could happen. But there are a couple of things you might ask yourself if you think that's true. To begin with, there are about 800 satellites in orbit around the Earth that are aimed downwards. Their cameras are aimed down. So they're making photos. You can see them. You know, you just go on Google Earth. I can find my car on Google Earth. So you would think that if there were things flying around, <laughs> that, that occasionally a Google Earth photograph would see that. There are, of course, much, much better images, uh, mostly you know, taken by the military, but not just the military of the United States, right? There are plenty of other, you know, those satellites are not all American by any means, right? And yet they don't seem to show any UFOs. Uh, you can do a, a quickie calculation. Amateur astronomers, you know, will go out with their telescopes at night whenever it's clear and check out uh, whatever they're looking at, the moons of Jupiter or nebulae or galaxy, whatever. They never see them either, right? Uh, there's a radar fence that the U.S. uses to detect, you know, incoming missiles and aircraft that shouldn't be in our airspace and stuff like that. And uh, they can see a marble, something the size of a marble, uh, about uh, 200 miles up, <laughs> which is pretty good, I have to say, for radar. Anyhow, yeah, that is All right. But but they don't see any of this stuff either, right? So you know, you've got 70 years of claims that the aliens are here occasionally crash landing in the New Mexico desert, but somehow nobody else sees them. If you had asked the Narragansett Indians of Massachusetts, you know, in, in uh, 1620, do you think there are Europeans here in Massachusetts? They would have absolutely no trouble pointing you to those guys down the road there. There they are, right? It, it wasn't something that the chiefs could keep secret. So, uh, Sure. Sir, how long have you been involved in this field? Well, I've, I studied astronomy in school, so if you consider that this field. I certainly bought a book about UFOs when I was in the eighth grade, so I guess I was about, you know, 14 years old or 13, something like that. Yeah, very interesting. I enjoyed it. Mm. All, the, all the photos in that book look like automobile hubcaps that somebody had thrown up in the air and taken a picture of. Mm -hmm. So since you've been in the field for so long, you've never had anybody call you, send you information or privy to anything that would remotely resemble 
extraterrestrials. Oh so no, every day, every day, Jenny Lynn. I get phone calls every day, uh, emails. You know, on those days I don't get phone calls, it's sometimes the same day, right? From people who are having difficulties with aliens in their personal lives. Actually, uh, for a while there, there were three people, they were all women, but I don't think that means anything, uh, who claimed that they were aliens, right? They was, were aliens. Yes, themselves. they claimed they were aliens. And I asked one of these women, I said, so how do you know you're an alien? And she said, the eyes, the eyes. So I said, well, I wrote her back. I said, do you have any photos of your eyes? And she sent me 10 photographs of her eyes. They were, just, well, they were just eyes. I mean, if you'd seen them on your sister or your cousin, Louise, you would have said, well, those are Louise's eyes, but you wouldn't say that she was an alien, I don't think. So I have seen pictures and I've heard of stories and I'm sure Jamie has seen some too, where they show an abandoned flat shape ship that they found in a desert somewhere or in some remote area that somehow seemed abandoned and they've referred to them as crashed spaced alien ships. Have you ever seen any of those pictures? And how did you explain those? What do you think those were? Well, if they look like spacecraft, if they look like saucers, that's your first clue that it's not for real because that whole term flying saucers, why do they always look like saucers? None of our spacecraft look like saucers, mm -hmm. right? That's because the first uh, instance, which actually got a lot of publicity, was in 1947, a, a guy who sold fire extinguishers, so forth, a guy by the name of Kenneth Arnold, he had his own private plane, or at least he could fly, I don't know if the plane was his, and he was flying around the state of Washington, and uh, he saw something, you know, out the window, and uh, it was very unusual, he thought it was, these things were moving very quickly, which, by the way, keep in mind, you can only tell if it's moving quickly if you know how far away it is, right, mm -hmm. otherwise you don't know, I mean, a bug could fly, and a fly could fly, you know, zip by your face and you would think, oh my God, that's 27 Gs and it's moving at 37,000 miles an hour. You know, it's just, it's just a couple of inches from your eyeballs. So you need to know how far away these things are. Anyhow, so he saw something. And when the, when the press interviewed him about this event, because he did uh, talk to a newspaper reporter, he said that they look like a kind of boomerangs and they moved the way saucers skipping on water move you know they sort of bounce 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 yeah yeah yeah. and ever after that they became flying saucers because the uh the reporter kind of misunderstood them so if they look but, like saucers you know that's wrong but you know um just just a quick question in regards to this um the, this pentagon disclosure um and that we know that you know we've got objects that are doing mock five speed um, and no visible propulsion doing these things, right? I mean, like, what what would you, what would be your take on that? So yeah, we have no we have no evidence of extraterrestrial, but but I mean, there's something, yeah. So yeah, oh, there's you... definitely something. Well, I'll, let me give you an mm -hmm. example. There there are three videos, and one of them is this white thing. It looks white. The these videos. Okay. This is kind of a technical thing of not much interest to the audience, but they are infrared videos, right? So they're made by a camera called a forward-looking infrared, ray, uh, sorry, forward-looking infrared camera, floor. And so anything that looks black in the image is hot, right? Or at least warm. And anything that looks white is cool. So one of these things, you see this thing, it's a, above the waves of the ocean and it sort of moves by the camera. That's just a balloon, probably a weather balloon. Anyhow, it's cooler than the air around it, okay? So, or cooler, I'm sorry, than the, the water beneath it. So it looks kind of white. And it only is moving because of the motion of the uh, F-18 Hornet, the, the plane. Okay, so that one's easy to explain. The other two show things that look like kind of a Tic Tac, you know, <laughs> uh, candy or just an elongated thing that occasionally rotates. And you know what that probably is? When you're up at 22,000 feet, because that was the altitude that at least some of these things were made from, at 22,000 feet, it's not that high, it's maybe four miles up or something. But if you're at 22,000 feet, the horizon, how far away you can see things, is, a, is close to 100 miles, okay? In fact, it's more than 100 miles. It's more like 150. Okay, 
So imagine that there's a plane, just a commercial jet, two engine, four engine jet, and it's 50 miles in front of this Navy jet. The Navy jet's camera is looking up the tail pipes of that plane, which of course they're jet engines, so they're very hot. So you get this elongated black thing because it's so far away, you don't see any detail, right? And so that, it makes this elongated black thing. And of course the radar from the ships doesn't find it, nor does the radar from the aircraft find it, because they're not looking 100 miles away. They're looking, you know, in the next mile or two. That's what's important if you're a Navy fighter. Right? You don't care what's 100 miles in front of you. You want to know what's in the next five miles in front of you. So they don't find it. And so I'm not saying that's what it was, but that's very, you know, reasonable. It doesn't involve aliens. So you have your choice. Aliens, commercial airplane. Aliens, commercial airplane. Mm. Sure. Yeah, well, you know, you've got, you got to look at everything. You know, you got to look at everything if you're open-minded. Yeah. You, know, you can't just jump to the alien, to the alien theory. Yeah. 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 Well, there is a project, as you know, by this Harvard professor, Avi Loeb. Uh, he wants to do an experiment. One problem with the whole UFO field is they don't do any experiments. Uh, they just, you know, look at data that have been already collected for other purposes, or they base it on witness testimony, which is just about the worst kind of evidence for science. You know, Isaac Newton didn't say, well, I, I think F equals MA because uh, I, I saw it. <laughs> you got to measure something. But anyhow, uh, this guy, Avi Loeb, is trying to do an experiment. And he's a Harvard professor, and he's a very smart guy, actually. Uh, so uh, probably to my detriment, I've been asked by him to be on his science advisory board. So right. I don't know what will come out of that. I'm not, I'm terribly hopeful, but we'll see. You're too humble. So uh, I, yeah. must I have a reason you. to be humble. Yes. When I first came to the United States back in the day, when I was at home raising two girls, I watched a show by a woman called, it was a talk show and her name was Sally Jesse Raphael. And the show was about three men who were somewhere in British Columbia, some lonely place out on the ocean fishing at night. And they describe this huge light that they cannot explain that sent the beam onto their boat. And then there are four or five hours of their lives that none of them can account for. One of them remembers being taken up from the boat onto an alien ship. And after this experience, he continued to get the beeping sound in his ear and it sort of drove him crazy. Mm. So they took him to the hospital and they did some x-rays on him and they found some strange looking crystal implanted in his leg. And these men, I, I watched them, they looked so convincing that somehow they were abducted by these aliens just because they're curious about us, that they weren't really hurt, but that this crystal that had been implanted in his leg, he felt was a way that he, they were monitoring humans through him and that crystal that was implanted in his leg. And I remember watching this and thinking, why would three grown men come on a show like this and seem so <laughs> convincing? And so I wonder about the people like them because I've heard and I'm Jamie, I don't know about you. Have you heard similar stories? Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting you should bring that up because I totally understand the skepticism. But you know, we're talking about a lot of people with stories. And let's say that like a massive percentage of them are telling lies or deceived or whatever. Yeah, whatever the case. Um what what if you know what what if one or two of them is right? I mean, some people have willingly undergone lie detector tests, and sometimes we you know there are events where there's multiple eyewitnesses that and the stories have remained the same for decades. So you have to wonder, you know. Yeah. Or, well, or, or, I, I, it would only take one. You don't need lots of them. Yeah. If, if one mm -hmm. of them had good uh, proof, or had proof, put it that way, if they had proof that mm -hmm. you know stood up. Mm. then uh, talk on it. You know, I would be mm. convinced too. 
the, the problem yeah. is that none of that of uh, the evidence that these people present has ever risen to the level where it would justify an exhibit on Exhibition Road in, in London, right? None yeah. of the science museums has anything about this. And why is that? I mean, it's not because the public isn't interested. The public's enormously interested. Mm. But none of that evidence is considered, you know, science. That's the problem. And mm. if you're going to make a claim that, you know, th that we're being visited, that's important enough that you ought to have good evidence for it. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it it sadly raises curiosity, but I I understand. Yeah, you need some you need some some good evidence. I I get it. But but I I've a, oh um, do you mind if I ask a question, generally? No, go ahead. Uh, okay, great. Oh, thanks. So uh, because I know that you you work for SETI, Seth, and uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong. But I I mean, I'm assuming because of you know your career that you you're all searching for extraterrestrials. So you believe that maybe that you're yet to find any evidence of them, but maybe somewhere inside of you, you, you would think that we're not alone in the, in the universe. Would that be accurate or? Oh, that's totally accurate, Jamie. Yeah, okay. no, I, uh, I definitely believe that the, there's plenty of uh, intelligence out there in the universe. There are like a trillion, that's a million million, a trillion planets just in our galaxy. And we can see on the order of two trillion other galaxies, each with a trillion planets. Those numbers are so large, right? That if, if, this is, if this is the best that the universe has to offer, all I can say is I'm really disappointed. Yeah. I, I hardly <laughs> believe that we're the only intelligence. But I mean, you know, that's like asking me, do you think there could be animals with big long noses that can pick up peanuts? I say, well, I don't know, but I mean, it's possible. Maybe there's an evolutionary niche for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact that I haven't seen them in my backyard doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means that they're somewhere else. That's, mm -hmm. that's all it means. Is it possible, Seth, that these um, uh, other life forms, whatever title umbrella we want to place them under, is it possible that they may not be detected by some of the devices that you use in your institute? Well, Is it possible that you're just missing them because you need a certain type of lens, camera, whatever technology to spot them? Well, I mean, that could be. I mean, we don't, our physics is not the end of all physics. You know, there, there, there may be ways to uh, exist without making anything our instruments can't measure. But if our instruments can't measure them, then I don't quite understand how Navy pilots can see them with their eyes either, right? You have to decide, are you going to accept evidence that's so straightforward that, you know, pilots can see it? There it is, Bob. Or are you going to say, no, there's no way they could see it. You need the kind of instruments that uh, we don't have or something like that. I mean, you know, you can't rule out what you don't know. But you can't have it both ways. You have to decide either we have the kind of capability to find these things or we don't, in which case you can essentially say anything you want, right? Mm. Well, there are people who believe that Bigfoot is real. Yes, there are. And <laughs> they're seen every day. Yeah, there, there are problems with Bigfoot. There was a big press conference here up the street <laughs> in Palo Alto. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. No, so uh, we, well, we, we covered it for our podcast, but never mind what, what the deal was. They had a press conference because some good old boy hunters in Georgia went out and found what they claim was a Bigfoot body. And they threw it into the back of their pickup truck and took it back and made a couple of very poor photos. And this press conference was about the fact that they had proven Bigfoot was real because, you know, there was this body. Now, <laughs> I have to tell you, they, they were very re reluctant to give any more detail. And so we, my producer and I, we kind of we uh, tracked it down and we found a, a costume shop, I think it was in either Queens or Brooklyn in New York, where these guys had rented the gorilla costume that they photographed later. And uh, these guys were all just making up a story for the notoriety. They thought they could make money on this deal. Look, here's the thing about Bigfoot. I mean, it's hard to have just one Bigfoot, right? It's like Nessie, the Loch Ness monster. You can't have just one because when that one dies, that's the end, right? Yeah. You, need, 
you need a what is called a minimum breeding density. You need, you know, you probably need at least 50 of them. I don't know the exact number would be. And uh, if there are that many of them so that the species doesn't die out right away, then presumably a lot of people would would see them. I, I, uh, I remember going to Loch Ness once a long time ago and in a local pub, I asked the woman behind the counter, I said, do people here see Nessie all the time? She says, only after a few drinks. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, Seth, we're going to run out of time soon. And the one thing I didn't ask you, which I should have at the inception, is to, ex to define SETI for those people who don't know. Oh, yeah. It's al almost my name. Well, it's S-E-T-I, and that stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And that's to find the aliens, you know, not over the Pacific off of off of San Diego or anything like that, but just to find them at home, as it were, because it turns out that if they have some reasonably powerful transmitters, either for their own television or radar, radar's pretty strong signal, you know, or FM radio, something like that, you can find them even at light years distance using the kind of technology we have today. So that's what the experiment is to try and see if we can pick up a signal from somebody else. We haven't so far. So, so. your instruments are, are because, because the reports we get of sightings are always in real rural, remote, lonely areas. A lot of people see them in Mount Shasta and in desert sort of quiet, empty areas. Right. Do you have detective in um, instruments in those areas? Well, actually it turns out we do, but it's totally coincidence. Uh, the telescopes that we use, we call them telescopes, radio telescopes, but they're just big antennas. And we have them in a place called Hat Creek, California, which is near, uh, well, it's about 25 miles north of uh, Mount Shasta. No, no, no. It's about 50 miles south of Mount Shasta, and it's north of Mount, what's the first one in the chain there? Anyhow, it's between two of these, these mountains. So it's in a part of California that's very rural, which means it's a good place to put one of these big antenna arrays because you don't get all the interference from people's you know, home electronics and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, you can go visit it next time you're up there. It's a beautiful country, I recommend it. Not too many good restaurants, but, but that's where we're looking for the aliens. Well, so they're supposed to be under Mount Shasta. Have you heard that? Uh, people believe that there are aliens working underground with the government under Mount Shasta. So oh, <laughs> maybe, under you're Mount on, Shasta? Maybe, maybe you're standing on top of them. Yeah, well, we're not on Mount Shasta exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was between Mount Shasta and Mount Lassen. We're actually a little closer to Mount Lassen, but who cares? Uh, yes, well, if the aliens are underground, that's very convenient because nobody can see them. <laughs> I think well, that's the point. In all of your years, because you've clearly been doing this for many, many, many. Oh, years. almost, almost centuries now. Yes. Oh wow. <laughs> so if anybody has come close to anything, have you ever had any information sent to you or received a phone call where you're like, you know, is it possible? Did you ever have anything come across your desk that that you that you thought? Could it be? Or have you always been able to look at the evidence sent to you and just discredit it as somebody uh, really wanting aliens to be part of our existence? Well, it's kind of a mixed bag, Jenny Lynn, because, uh, you know, if they, they claim that they saw, you know, a, a typical call might be, well, 23 years ago, you know, I was out in the backyard and I uh, looked up at the sky and I saw this thing and these big lights were flying and it was a triangular craft. For some reason, the aliens also like triangular craft. Uh, and it, you know, it was, it was headed for town or something like that. Do you know what it was? I don't know what it was. I mean, <laughs> very hard for me to know what it was, but I do ask the people who get in touch with me, uh, you know, have one of these uh, uh, things they want to relate. I ask, do you happen to have any photos or you know, film or video, something. And in about half the cases, they do. And I say, well, I don't know if you want to send it to me, but if you do, I'll take a look. And so they do, you know, fairly frequently send me stuff. Now, it turns out that 
photography is a, is a hobby of mine I've had since the age of eight. So I, often I can tell them, I can say, well, you know what that is? That's, that's internal reflection in the glass elements of your zoom lens. That's what that is. Now, they're never happy when I tell them this. They, they, never, they never say, thanks, Seth. Wow, okay, great. <laughs> now I know what it was, but you know, whatever. But I've never seen anything where I thought, my God, this is it, right? I mean, nothing would make us happier here at the SETI Institute to learn than to learn that there are aliens just out and about. They're just, you know, around the neighborhood. If they are here, by the way, I just suggest to you that if they are here, you got to say they're the best house guests ever, right? I mean, they don't kill anybody. They don't solve any of our problems, right? They've been here, if you believe it, uh, for 70 years, and they've done essentially nothing, nothing. They don't do anything. And, and I'm sure that the Incas of uh, Peru would have liked it much better if the Spaniards had come to their, their country and not done anything, <laughs> but mm. it didn't work out that way in any case. Mm. So, you know, the aliens are great. I mean, I'm happy to coexist with them because they don't seem to ask much. Right. Well, if you're someone watching this segment and you have seen an alien and you have the evidence, please send it to Seth. He has been working long and hard to show us that the aliens don't exist. So maybe it's time to Try show to him on before he retires. Yes, right. That's right. Send it to me. If, if it's for real, it, it will mean job security for me. So, you know, take some pity on my precarious situation and send me yeah. the best evidence you have. Yeah. Jamie, do you want to ask Seth anything else? We're almost out of time. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I would love to ask um, Seth, like, okay, so do you believe that one day um, that you'll, you know, with the work that you're doing, um, if you you know continue persevering, if SETI continues along its path, that one day uh, we'll we'll sort of make contact or you know discover something. Well, I do. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't do this. I mean, oh, oh yeah, of course, yeah. But do you yeah, think I it mean, could be in your lifetime, or or do you think well, we're a long way off? I, I made the mistake of during a talk I was giving in Europe. I uh, I bet everybody in the audience uh, flat white. Uh, I think I said a cup of Starbucks. Anyhow, a cup of coffee. <laughs> that we would we would find the aliens by about 2035 and that was based yeah, on that. the speed at which the you know the equipment is getting faster uh that's mostly computer technology and we're in the silicon valley here so we're well aware of how fast computer technology improves anyhow so i did that so um you know either by 2035 you'll wake up and there'll be something to talk about with your spouse oh look uh louise they found aliens or <laughs> you get a cup of coffee right so you really can't lose i'm, I'm buying starbucks stock <laughs> just in case <laughs> <laughs> but deep down inside what do you really believe no i really do believe that i i think so because by 2035 various seti experiments will have um, looked at more than a million star systems and you know just this is sort of like where we came in the Frank Drake equation kind of thing again. But I figured that if you look at a million, the chances that you'll find one where there's some signals coming from uh, don't sound to me like that's an impossible wish. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. You have anything else, Jamie? Yeah, uh, have you got any vacancies there at SETI? <laughs> yeah, the vacancy. I'll, I'll, I'll come and join you, man. Yeah, it, it might be my office, I don't know. Oh, uh, I'll make <laughs> I'll make the coffee or something. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, I know that um, there's so much in the world that cannot be explained. And for us to think we know everything would be hugely egotistical. And unfortunately, we live in a world where if you don't have the proof, it's just an opinion or an idea. Because like, I believe someone told me once, the difference between those who believe and those who don't is the evidence. So I guess until the evidence has really come forward and you experts at the SETI Institute are convinced that this evidence is really supporting something that fit the, the description 
of a UFO or an alien. We will continue to hear of people seeing them and have you said, pop their bubble. Well, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not interested in popping and anybody's diss, bubble, but. And diss their ideas of what they think they're seeing. Yeah. Because I am going to tell you, I have many friends that are convinced that they've seen aliens. And I know many pilots and I always ask them, they're probably sick of me. Do you ever, have you ever seen a UFO? Have you ever seen an alien? They go all the time, Jenny. We see things all the time we can't explain. And that's what we call them because they're on identified flying objects. So I don't know, Seth, we all don't know, but if you've got these big sophisticated equipment mounted in places where you can monitor this and you are saying no, until someone comes forward well, with some evidence, I just have to accept no. Well, no, you don't, Jenny, and you won't anyhow. Look. <laughs> I, you know me so well. <laughs> I, well yeah. No, I mean, you know, there, there could be aliens camped out on the summit of Mount Shasta, and our equipment would never find them. We're looking at, you know, things that are very far away. So anything that's nearby, we wouldn't find. But there are plenty of other things that would find them. So uh, that's the thing. I mean, you know, you're right. We certainly don't know everything. Uh, probably we're a long way from knowing everything. But on the other hand, in science, you know, it's like somebody said, if it's, it's the quality of the evidence. Whoever told you that, did you believe them? Did they show you at least some evidence of what they were saying was true? I, I assume so. <laughs> well, you know, here in the UK, um, we, we have a lot of crop circles and you can tell the difference between the fake ones and the ones that are a mystery because like the fake ones are obvious but the ones that are a mystery are kind of done in the pitch dark very quickly with amazing precision and then there's like um the, the crops aren't damaged they're weaved there's radiation readings on the ground there's like loads of strange anomalies and these crop circles they they're popping up all over the place in like the wiltshire area well, um, Hampshire and Wiltshire's where they normally yeah. pop up. But on the other hand, do pay attention to the fact, Jamie, that they've got much more compl complex with time. And they're not actually not so complex to begin with. They're very symmetrical. Mm -hmm. And anybody familiar with uh, information theory knows that if there's a lot of symmetry, then uh, there's no message, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. And, you know, my grandparents had a tile bathroom floor in their apartment in, in New York. And, uh, you know, every other tile was black. And then the white tile, black tile, white tile, black. So it was a lot of symmetry. Mm -hmm. And so you could sit there and try and read the floor. But mm -hmm. it, it was, you know, it wasn't very interesting because there's no information in it because of the high symmetry. And that's true also for the crop circles. And in fact, there are plenty of these artist collectives in, uh, in the UK who say, yeah, we built that. And you can refuse to believe them if you want. But the fact that there's some radioactivity there, I, I suggest you just go out in your backyard in Ireland with a Geiger mm -hmm. counter and you'll find some radioactivity too. That doesn't mean too much. Sure. Yeah. Well, yes, unfortunately, right. we are out of time. But before I wrap this up, this is what I think, Seth. I think they are so sophisticated and so much more intelligent than we are that they've learned how to be elusive and we can't spot them, even with our most sophisticated technology. There you go, my two cents. All right. Well, <laughs> you're, the, you're the host of the show, so I bow to that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but you're the expert. So anyway, before I go, is there anything you want to leave with my viewer, Seth? No, I don't think so. I, I know uh, about a third of you will be hopping mad. Thanks so much. But if we've done nothing else, we've at least got your juices flowing. Look at it that way. It's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much, Jamie. What about you? No, I, I've, I, it's been a great honor to be a part of this. And um, I thank you, Seth. And, and um, I think it's great the work you're doing. And I, I also respect you because, um, you know, I think that we need to um, have the due diligence that you have that we don't jump to conclusions. I respect that completely. And, you know, maybe one day, I, I'm a believer, um, but, 
you know, I think maybe one day we'll get all the evidence we need and it will be, it'll be great and we can all celebrate. You know, maybe we'll make some contacts and learn from another civilization. It'll be, it'll be great. So, yeah. Stay away from the Rendlesham Forest. Oh, yeah. Well, that's another one. Yeah. Yeah, I've been there, actually. Have you? Yeah, that was well documented. Well, yeah, but there, there's, a, again, there are perfectly reasonable explanations for what happened, just as there are for mm. Roswell and many of these others. Sure. But you don't read about them too often. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn. I continue to look for the best and the most inspiring, engaging conversations to share with you. And I am sure you're going to agree with me that this was one of them. Thank you so much to Dr. Shostak. Thank you so much to Jamie Small. Thank you for continuing to watch Conversations with Jenny Lynn. When a conversation is all you need to be inspired, and I'm sure you're hugely inspired from this. And I will see you soon. Thank you. Well, 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 what did you think of that? Wasn't that interesting? And isn't Seth such a, a nice man? And that was so good of him to um, take some time and do the interview. Well, you know, Seth is an interesting man and I respect him a lot and he's got a fantastic career. I got the impression from Seth that he's he treads very carefully because, you know, he's in a very high profile position um, and he's got a very important job. And of course, he's a scientist, and scientists are very um, restrained when it comes to um, adopting belief systems because everything's based on scientific rigorous testing, confirmation, collaboration. And so, you know, you can't jump to conclusions willy nilly. And that's exactly Seth right there, you know, which is right. It's, it's the right way to be, um, especially in that position. Okay. So, you know, I felt that. Um, you know, uh, one thing I would like, and, and I, I no doubt I would love to talk to Seth again, be part of that again. And I think that I would like to bring into the conversation, how do we define evidence? You know, what, what is sufficient evidence? What's acceptable evidence? What, at what point does the evidence become acceptable evidence that we can draw a conclusion from, right? Because, you know, we, we have a lot of collaborating eyewitness testimony. We have trained observer collaborating eyewitness testimony. We have satellite and radar confirmation. We have, in some cases, indentations in the ground, radiation readings. We got, there's like a, there's a, a, a ton of um, very, well, there's a ton of what, could be potentially good evidence of extraterrestrials visiting the Earth. There is. I believe so. I believe so. Um, you know, Seth is more restrained on that and, and doesn't want to come to that conclusion because he's looking for that very special evidence that can be, um, you know, measured in, with a lot stronger criteria as what, like, lay people like me and you may require. Um, but, you know... I think that Jenna Lynn, Jenny Lynn, she always tells me off for mispronouncing her name. It's Jenny Lynn. Jenny Lynn, she's told me in previous conversations something that very much resonates with me. And I also share the belief with her. And it's a very simple saying that she says, and she says it often. And she says, there's no smoke without fire. And it's so true. There is no smoke without fire. When we have enough people and enough so-called sightings and enough of these disclosed documents and they just keep coming and coming and coming. Can we write them off? Can we? Can we write them off? Can we dismiss them? There is no smoke without fire. There has to be something in it. That, that's, that's what I personally believe that there does. Um, you know, take, for example, the recent Pentagon disclosure. So in the interview with Seth, if you can recall, uh, he was giving explanations as to uh, what 
you know, those sightings from the Air Force and the Navy could be, right? And yes, of course, they were logical explanations, but I would argue, hang on a second, like, they know what, they, they're trained to know about speed, about distance, and about heat signatures, and, you know, they, they know what they're looking at. They can, they can go through that process of elimination. You know, I don't believe that the U.S. military would um, class a flying object as a U.S. P as a UAP if it was something easily explained. Um, I, I just don't believe that. I don't. I don't. And um, you know, they are a mystery. Like they wouldn't be deemed a mystery. They wouldn't be deemed as unidentified if they could be identified as well. You know, this was, you know, a balloon or this was a, you know, a long streak of heat or whatever that, that caused it, like a black cylinder or however. I mean, Seth describes it better than what I am recalling it. But, yeah, I, I think that they're beyond, I think they have more um, ability to discern um, than that. That's that's my thoughts on it. Um, of course, we've got whistleblowers in government, too. Uh, we've got a lot of, I mean, the Pentagon have admitted publicly that we are seeing the tip of the iceberg of this unclassified documents, declassified documents. There is obviously a lot yet to be declassified if they will be uh, declassified. You know, we're talking about, you know, we, yes, we've got an eight page document in June. Well, we're only seeing a little bit. Um, I have heard it be speculated that they have got photographic evidence of objects far, far closer. And there's far more compelling evidence of UAPs that we cannot conclude that they're extraterrestrial, but of course we can conclude that they're um, very, very advanced and quite possibly extraterrestrial given how advanced they are. And, um, the likelihood that we can develop such technology you know so yeah at the end of the conversation i am still i am a believer in uh extraterrestrials visiting we can talk about ancient civilizations and the things they wrote about but that's that opens up a whole new can of worms and long discussion so we'll not go there but yeah i i still remain a believer and i believe that uh, Seth himself is a believer too, um, that we're not alone in the universe. And I think he makes that quite clear in the interview because otherwise why would he be doing his job? And what's the purpose of SETI? It's, it's an acronym for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Well, yeah, they're searching. They wouldn't search if they didn't think there was anything to find. So, you know, yeah, Seth believes that they're out there. Where we differ is that uh, he thinks they haven't been here yet. And I think that there is a very strong possibility that they have been here in our ancient past and are very possibly here now. Um, and I would agree with Seth so far as we don't have hard evidence, but I would, I would actually say we don't have hard evidence that we general public are privy to. But that doesn't mean that there is no hard evidence because, you know, we live in a very secretive world. Um, there's a lot of secrecy, you know, there is. So that's my final thoughts. And um, yeah, so thank you, everybody. Please put your comments down below in the comments part and let me know your thoughts and your questions. And um, let's uh, do this again sometime, I really hope. Okay, take care. Goodbye.